Hello and welcome back to my YouTube channel. My name is Cami and I am a chronically online college student. This video is my alternative assignment for my Philosophy 8 class. This course explores the world's major religions and their origins, history, and significant ideas. In this video, I will be discussing Module 9, Christianity. As always, I will list all my sources in the description below. Before we even dove into the Christianity modules, I wrote down in my notebook, quote, I will try my best to be open-minded and curious and try to put my biases and criticisms aside for these modules, end quote. However, I may have failed in that goal as lots of my reflections and connections are based on these pre-existing biases that I've had based on my experiences in different denominations of Christianity. So with that disclaimer in mind, let's dive in. I was interested to learn that initially the Church of Christianity was actually small and persecuted, which is a stark contrast to the world superpower that it is now. I also learned that there are three different types of Christianity, Eastern Orthodox, Roman Catholic, and Protestant. Dr. Glorian informs us that the split between the Orthodox and Catholics happened in 1054, and I think maybe that's the reason we don't hear about Eastern Orthodox very much. The reason for the split had to do primarily with the Pope's claims of ultimate authority, and funny enough that this is also one of the main reasons for the Protestant Reformation. The Protestant Reformation is most famously known by Martin Luther nailing his list of 95 complaints with the Catholic Church to the door of the Catholic Church. Though Martin Luther was a catalyst for the Protestant Reformation, this had been building for a while, and his actions inspired others like John Calvin to further reform and fine-tune their own Protestant faiths. It's important to remember that Martin Luther was a Catholic monk and scholar, so he was a mystical follower of Catholic beliefs. But, as Dr. Glorian explains, Luther, quote, experienced great anxiety about his own salvation, despite doing everything the church suggested. He had a pervasive sense of guilt and feared he was lost. He found relief in the idea of grace, end quote. And through this idea of grace, he showed himself that blindly following the church's authority wasn't necessarily going to be the thing that led him to salvation, but salvation could be gained through faith in God's grace. I think that's beautiful, and I think it also lends a helpful lesson to those who are religious, and even those who aren't religious, that there's nothing wrong in reflecting on and revising your beliefs and viewpoints if that's necessary. And this is a theme I'll discuss more later on. So the Catholic Counter-Reformation came out of the Protestant Reformation, which is pretty self-explanatory, so we'll just move along. <laughs> Susan, don't. I know. I'm just kidding. In response to this Protestants breaking away from Catholicism, the church had a bit of an overhaul and did some reform of their own. Quote, much purification came about as abuses were corrected and important changes in things such as education took place, end quote. However, the Catholic Church could still be seen as conservative because they believed that the Protestant reformers had taken a lot of aspects too far. So the Catholics wanted to ensure that their teachings were protected through doctrine and other safeguards. With the Catholics on the defensive, the division between the three groups of Christianity was tense. Quote, these groups despised each other and believed their group alone was the one true faith and all others were wrong. End quote. And in my experience, though I've never participated in Eastern Orthodox, I've seen individuals and entire churches that still despise one another. The first and probably the most popular that comes to mind is the Westboro Baptist Church, which seem to have completely disregarded their original holy books and their teachings and just hate everybody who isn't a member of their insular hate community. I mean, church. Also, out of that awful, there is a little bit of good. There's a TED Talk on YouTube that I have linked below from one of the eldest daughters of the Westboro Baptist Church. Her name's Megan, and she left the church, and her TED Talk is about the lessons that she's had since leaving and how her perspectives have changed, and it's so profound. I highly recommend you check it out. Knowing about this tension and experiencing it firsthand has me interacting with many Christians with my guard up, worried that I may offend or accidentally start a theological argument based on denominational differences that was never intended. It was relieving, though, to read that in modern times there's been more of a prominent movement to build bridges between these denominations. I think this is a step in the right direction. I think the more Christians can find similarities and things they appreciate about the other denominations and focus less on their differences in practices or perspectives, the more likely the world is to be 
a more loving and forgiving place. I want to briefly share a few things that Dr. Glorian said that I deeply resonated with. Quote, the effort is being made to see the different denominations as various flavors and colors that do not necessarily need to be blended to appreciate their beauty and significance, end quote. I liked this because I've always said flavors instead of denominations or Christian sex. And that's just honestly how I see the world in general in flavors or, you know, in a spectrum rather than, you know, black and white or on a binary. And honestly, to say the spectrum of Christianity seems, I don't know, it just seems off. I also found an interesting appreciation for his pointing out that the differences in these 45 different denominations make them unique and that it's worth appreciating the inherent beauty of faith in each of them. Next, it's time to talk about my own personal brand of rage fuel, Christianity and its impact on women. I'm going to go out on a limb and assume that anybody with any type of experience with Christianity is familiar with the challenges that women face, even if their experience is tertiary. It's pretty obvious in the world that we live in. Dr. Glorian shares, quote, the history of women in Christianity is pretty bleak. From early on, women had a second-class role and were often looked down upon and considered a source of evil and temptation, end quote. Interestingly, after years of contemplating this very issue, I've created a math equation to help illustrate this belief pattern. Let's go to the board, shall we? Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, welcome to the whiteboard. I know I said this was a math equation, but it's a court case now. I've watched a lot of Law & Order. Bear with me. Today, I am here to argue the case that women, oh, women. They're bad, all right? And I'm gonna prove it based on a Christian perspective. You watch, just... I hear you saying, how are women bad? Women are great. And I would agree with you, but have you ever thought to consider Eve? Who was Eve, ladies and gentlemen of the jury? Eve was the original sinner. She is the reason her and Adam got sent out of Eden and you know what else she is? She is the reason for the downfall of all mankind. The reason that sin exists, right? You know what else she is? That's right. Eve is a woman. How dare she? Now, if we refer back up to here, you know what else is bad? Sin. Sin is so bad. It's talked about all the time in the Bible. Don't sin, it's bad, right? All right, so we got that. So if sin is bad, and sin came from Eve, and Eve is a woman, women are bad. I rest my case, Your Honor. One thing I instantly think of with that equation or argument is in many denominations, the unspoken or spoken and written rule is that it is the woman's responsibility to be modest and conservative to keep their brothers in Christ from slipping into temptation and sin. These must be the same people that neglect to teach their young boys and men the Bible verse that says, if thy eye offends thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. Which, in case you didn't know, essentially means if you find your eyes wandering and causing you to feel tempted or distracted, you should look away and mind your own business, lest you not sin. Or if you'd like, you can upgrade your combo to the biblical style for only $1 more and actually pluck out your eyeballs. Order now. Seriously. Why is it the woman's responsibility to obey, serve, and protect her husband? In a patriarchal view, wouldn't it make more sense for the man to be the protector and therefore up to the father or the husband to defend their daughters and wives from lecherous eyes? Apparently not. Interesting. And you really have to wonder, are these the same people that vote for religiously motivated politicians that, I don't know, take away the rights of already oppressed citizens? You know, I don't know. I'm no expert. But it's something worth considering. This view that women are inherently sinful or second class isn't traced back to Jesus' teachings or the way that he lived his life, but he did still live in a patriarchal society which was probably more stringent than the modern patriarchal system we live in right now. Jesus was such a radical for his time, especially in his acceptance of women and what significant roles they could participate in. The most heartbreaking role women played was, quote, when Jesus was crucified, all his male disciples except John abandoned him, but the women, including his mother, are reported to have stood at the foot of the cross, end quote. 
I also know from years of Sunday school that it was women who originally found Jesus when he first resurrected and women who dressed his wounds and prepared him to be buried. And the image that that evokes in my head makes my heart just shatter. I can just feel this collective pain and grief these women must have felt in losing such an important teacher and such an influential man in their life. And I could not even begin to fathom the pain of losing a child in such a gruesome way. I think one of the only positive takeaways from the specific act of lethal violence is what Jesus said as he was being crucified. Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they are doing. While being murdered, this man prayed for the perpetrators of his death. He did not pray that he would survive this and get to live another day with his mother and his friends. He did not pray that there would be some sort of vengeance for his life and some sort of retribution. No, he prayed that the men who kill him would have God's mercy. I think that if we as people in general could take even just the smallest nugget of love and forgiveness from that message and work that into our daily lives, our world would be so much better. Jesus' central message was love, forgiveness, and empathy. He also explicitly condemned hypocrisy, which is, as Dr. Glorian said, sad and ironic considering the times we live in. But I'm going to talk more about that in my final thoughts. Right now, it's time to continue into the rage fuel and talk about Christian missionaries. I'll do what I can to keep this brief because I still have a little bit to cover, but I did highlight a great deal and I wrote a lot of reflections, so I'll have to cut a bunch out. I also have a rambling voice note from when I was reading the essay that I felt the need to make due to the instant rush of emotions. I'm also going to insert another disclaimer here that I am morally against mission trips, whether they're humanitarian or religious in motivation, um, unless it's for, you know, an actual disaster relief. But if you're just, you know, going to Uganda for funsies to help build this church, I think, um, I have some feelings. But with that said, I found my viewpoints kind of challenged, but also affirmed at the same time while reading about the history of missionaries and their modern impact. Je suis Matteo Rissi traveled to China in 1583, and while there he found what he described as an advanced culture with laws, philosophies, and written languages, and a culture that had made discoveries in science that hadn't yet been seen in the Western world. Quote, his approach was therefore one of respect, end quote which made me wonder if he had stumbled upon a more primitive society, would his approach have been less respectful or different in any way? It's another thing that we could never know, but I think it is something that's interesting to question. Anyway, while he was in China, he learned the language, which is impressive. Do you know how long it takes to learn Chinese? And he spread the gospel in Chinese. And at the same time, you know, he taught them Western skills and quote, met them on an equal level of intellectual respect, end quote. Which, for the time, is unheard of, but given today's standards kind of feels like just bare minimum. Dr. Glorian's passage about Risi was so thought-provoking to me. He shared that by translating these scriptures and saying the Mass in Chinese, he's obviously not expecting these people to learn Latin, and he also didn't expect them to give up their important pagan practices like ancestor reverence. Quote, Risi did not feel it interfered with the essentials of Christianity. Alas, for the time he was living in, Risi was considered too radical, end quote. I think that's honestly a shame because he was too radical for his own time, yet probably would not in any way be regarded as a radical by today's standards. I think even more shameful was that his practices and his methods were condemned, which well, honestly makes me angry because I just... Just think for a second about what our world could have been like if Reese's methods had been the industry standard. I think it's possible our world would have shared more love and appreciation of different cultures and practices and beliefs, and we wouldn't be, especially in America, so hung up on forcing people into these same beliefs and rituals that we practice, the general we. Dr. Glorian continues to share the modern impact of Christianity spreading worldwide by saying, quote, Christians from Europe and America 
have been much more willing to allow Native people to express their Christian understanding in their own cultural ways. For example, a Christian service in Africa will often include Native drumming and dance while emphasizing on the, the healing and ecstatic experiences often a part of the Native religious services before Christianity was brought to Africa, end quote. And this, this is where I started to lose it. Because while it is just like the slightest bit reassuring, it still feels like less than the bare minimum of respect for a different culture. Rant soapbox time, let's do it. This one goes out to the people in charge of missionaries and the powers that be. Is this on? <clears throat> Letting and allowing native people to have some aspects of their native culture expressed in your religious beliefs that these people were doing just fine without long before the first missionaries ever came along. This feels like infantilization of, like, a whole culture, and honestly, it's an ick for me. So, like, just stop it. Do better. As we near the end of our time together, it's time to talk about Christianity's dark and challenging sides. One issue, like we just discussed, is the opposing and ever-arguing viewpoints on what women's real role in faith and home life is, and still one even more extensive than that is how Christianity has dominated the world's political stage. Though it's relevant to note that even though I, like many, live in an algorithmically devised echo chamber, we still rarely see stories of the news praising Christians or any work of the church. The last time I remember a good story coming out from the church is when one of the popes said that it was okay to be gay, because that was huge. But because it's taken such a powerful hold on our world, it's really easy to see and evaluate the dark sides of this religion. Christians in general just can't seem to follow the teachings of Jesus to love one another and, and demonstrate that love through helping each other. Instead, they spark hatred and anger, encroaching on safe places to condemn strangers who are just living their lives, electing politicians who are stripping away rights of people who just want to live their lives. Look, here's the thing, quick aside, I think that you are completely entitled to believe whatever you want to believe. You want to believe in God, you want to believe in Allah, you want to believe in the flying spaghetti monster, you want to believe in any of the Hindu gods, you want to believe in no God, that's perfectly fine. You're allowed to believe that. What is not okay is you saying that I believe this and so therefore everybody has to believe this. That's not okay. Dr. Glorian ponders, quote, perhaps the message of Jesus was just too radical to be believed and lived, end quote. And I think, yeah, it is hard to follow, and probably impossible if you're a pre-rational thinker. This person, who is imaginary in my head, but inspired by many people I have met, blindly follows a faith that they only follow because it's what their parents taught them to believe. They have never once taken the time to step back and deconstruct or evaluate what it is that they believe, what their morals and values are. Instead, they are just blindly, numbly following. They're going through the motions. That's not faith. That's blind obedience. It's submission. Which, in one part, I guess is kind of the point, but also... No. On the other hand, though, for rational and post-rational thinkers, these messages are easy to study, interpret, and live by. These people are also the people who questioned their faith and deconstructed their beliefs and fine-tuned their lives and practices to follow their path in a God-honoring way. Honestly, if you've not examined your faith, how do you know what you believe? I also think that if you're in a church where your pastor tells you not to ask questions, run out of there? Girl, get and quit. Find a new place to worship that welcomes questions. Enc not even welcome, encourages questions, especially the tough ones. A good teacher will encourage them and will want to learn more so that everybody can have some new perspective. To me, the best part of having faith in a belief system is questioning and identifying what it is that you believe in and why. I have a book here with me that I have had since I was a very small child and the reason it is relevant is because I was going to share passage from this book last week, and I was planning on making a reflection based on a story in this book, but obviously I didn't make a video last week due to a multitude of time management issues, and I was disappointed that I didn't get to share this story because it's my absolute favorite, but I think since 
the idea of Jesus condemning hypocrisy was brought up during this week's module, I can still incorporate this. It also relates to the way that Jesus treated women, so I'm going to share it. And you know what? Maybe I could get points for last week's video. Anyway, this story comes from a book that I had when I was a child, like I said. Uh, this is Jesus' Healings, part one, the three parts. So this book is meant for people of all ages, and it's got maps and pictures, so it's a great little interactive guide to different stories about Jesus and what he taught. And this one is titled Woman Healed of Sin. It's my favorite. Uh, as you can tell, it's been dog-eared. It's got stickers all over the place. Uh, it's got schmutz. Uh, it's also the place where the spine is the most cracked. So, <laughs> And now it's time for Bible Stories with Cammy, the part of the show where Cammy comes out and tells a Bible story. So essentially, Jesus is hanging out with this dude, Simon. And Simon's a Pharisee, which means he's basically a religious leader, but he's one of those people who thinks he knows better than everybody, and he's going to try and prove Jesus wrong. So in order to try and catch Jesus in a trap, he's going to bring him over to a dinner party to see if he can catch him breaking the law, right? And the reason he does this is because the rumor's going around that Jesus is a prophet. So Simon wants to test it. He's like, oh, a real prophet's going to follow all the laws to the letter. But we know J-Man. He's always got some sort of trick up his sleeve. So what happens is that Mary Magdalene, who's, you know, a woman of the night, comes up and everybody knows who she is and everybody's like, who invited her? She's not supposed to be here. Why is she here? And she just like beelines it straight for Jesus. And she washes his feet with her tears. After that, she dries his feet with her hair. And then she anoints his feet with perfumed oil. And Simon is just like, you let her touch you? Do you know who she is? Do you know what she's done? And Jesus says, yeah, I'm not stupid. I know exactly who she is. But also, are you stupid, Simon? You know, just as well as I do, that it is custom for the host to wash their guests' feet. You know that it is custom to anoint your guest's head with oil. And you didn't do any of those things. You didn't even bother to bring out water for me to wash my own feet. This woman just bathed my feet in her tears. How dare you try to pull a moral high ground on me? And then he turns to the woman and he says, you know what, look, dude, you're free of sin. Like, you're, you're good. You are saved. Go about and be peaceful. Live your life. And she does. And so in this, he's taking simon trying to get him and he shows him his own hypocrisy in not only the laws but the way that these people are so letter to the law following of these hypocritical laws it also shows that regardless of her profession he deeply valued women and what they had to offer there are there are so many stories in just these two out of the three parts of books of jesus being just amazing with women and children and those who are outcasted by society and I find it amazing in the worst way is that a lot of people who claim to be Christians don't follow what's clearly illustrated both in words and in pictures definitions annotations like this is easy to understand why is it so hard for people to follow? Is it really that hard to just love your neighbor? If so, that's just a really sad thought to have. All I can think about these people is if Jesus were to come back, would he recognize you as a follower? We might never know. Thank you so much for watching my video. This was a very interesting topic to research because I kind of went into it thinking that I knew it all, but clearly I didn't. And I was honestly surprised to have as many takeaways from this lesson as I did. I hope I've reflected and explained things in a way that is understandable and hopefully sparked some discussion and questions of your own. As I mentioned at the beginning and I think a couple of times throughout the video, all of my sources are in the description below and I highly recommend you check out every single one of the videos below. As always, a huge thank you to Dr. Glorian for allowing me to create assignments that help me better learn, understand, and engage with the course material. And with that, the video is over, and I will see you next time. Bye!